So why don't we get started? So today we're going to continue on where we left off and hopefully uh, finish the module um, for all of the introductory material uh, pertaining to chapter one in the book. And so where we last left off, we talked about the IO subsystem. And the IO subsystem, excuse me, is that part of the kernel uh, that is responsible for managing all of the IO devices. And as we talked about, each IO device has associated with it an IO controller, and that IO controller interacts with some buffer, so some local memory associated with the IO device. Uh, and it's that local buffer at each IO controller or managed by each IO controller that is responsible uh, for transferring memory uh, to and from uh, that IO device into that local buffer and then into uh, RAM, right? And that transaction is facilitated uh, by or through the CPU. And so as such, uh, the IO uh, subsystem in any operating system kernel uh, is going to perform a type of memory management. It's managing uh, the uh, ushering of data to and from all of those uh, memory buffers uh, associated with each of the I.O. devices. So memory management is one of the things that the I.O. subsystem is responsible for. And now, for this I.O. memory management, it's different from memory management as it pertains to main memory or, or RAM. Uh, the I.O. subsystem also um, deals with the device driver interface. And now, when you're dealing with any kind of peripheral, be it a keyboard or printer or network card, so forth, um, you don't have to deal with all the details of interacting with the stepper motors that control the print heads and, uh, you know, the laser printer uh, spit out a certain uh, color pixel on the page uh, from your toner mixtures or any of that stuff. That's all done. All of those details are all handled by the device driver. Uh, and so on the device side, uh, it's very complicated. But on the program interface side, the device driver is quite simple. You have basic commands uh, that, such that if you put a certain value in a command buffer, it causes the underlying device uh, to do something. And so um, IO subsystem also uh, presents and interacts with all of the device drivers associated with your specific uh, pieces of hardware. Okay. Any questions about this? No? All right. So let's continue on. And let's look at protection uh, and security. Hopefully, uh, yes. Uh, so protection uh, is a big deal uh, when it comes to operating systems. As we said at the outset, uh, the operating system is used to share resources. And it shares resources among a bunch of users and processes uh, that might want to use those resources, resources like RAM, resources like your network card, resources like your uh, printer and all of your other uh, devices attached to our von Neumann uh, architecture. And so the protection part uh, is the keeping uh, apart from one another all of the different processes or entities or users that might want to access these resources. And so when you have multiple entities vying uh, for this limited set of resources, you have to separate them out from one another. Right? That both means arbitrating uh, between concurrent accesses uh, to these resources, uh, as well as making sure that one request doesn't wipe out uh, or overwrite or interact with ad uh, adversely uh, with another request. Another one is security, and you know we're not going to spend a lot of time in this class uh, on security. Uh, we should have a security course again at some point. Uh, but this deals with uh, the protection of your system in general. And those threats uh, that you're protecting against can come from two sources. Uh, there's a so-called outsider threat, so people from the outside uh, wanting to uh, apply uh, nefarious uh, uh, means on your system. And that could be to try to deny you service uh, of your system. It could be to try to get data or exfiltrate, take something uh, off of your system. Right? Or it could be to try to masquerade. Right? And so um, internet worms are particularly uh, damning in that once someone hacks your system, they can now access your address book and send out an email on your behalf, making it look like you to all of the people with whom you communicate. And so the theory there is people are more likely to trust an email from someone with whom they've exchanged a lot of messages uh, in the past um, with. Security also deals with the so-called insider threat. So there's an insider threat and there's an outsider threat. And the insider threat uh, is someone on the inside 
It could be a disgruntled employee or it could be somebody who just doesn't know any better, right? Uh, a novice user or, you know, someone who has access to something but doesn't know completely how to use it could cause damage. And so when you deal with security, uh, you typically address both the insider threat uh, as well as the outsider threat. And that's beyond the scope of this course, uh, but certainly we will just touch at a very high level on some key aspects of security, if time permits, uh, towards the end of the semester. Okay, so protection. So systems, of course, we just got done saying uh, that you can have many users uh, using a system. And associated with each user is an identity. Similarly to how you each have a social security number, there's a so-called user ID associated with every entity, every person that wants to uh, connect to a machine and ultimately use its resources. Uh, now, you know your username, right? That's your login name. But your login name is really just something that's a convenience for uh, human beings, for us. Uh, but the computer, when it's dealing with user identities, it traffics in numbers. And the only reason for your username is just to make it easier for you to remember what your identity is instead of user number, you know, 95734, right? That's a lot harder to remember than just what your username is, first initial, uh, last name, or some sort of uh, mixture of uh, various pieces of information. So then every time uh, you or a program that you run uh, wants to interact with resources on the system, let's say you create a file or you want to send out data across the network, uh, that's associated with your user ID. So in essence, ownership uh, of something like you know, a file that has been written or some sort of outgoing uh, data stream over the network, ownership of that information is tagged with your user ID. And therefore, you can set these so-called permissions, and these permissions allow you to control who is allowed to access, to read, or to write uh, certain pieces of information, and that's the person who owns it, i.e. the creator. Now, there are ways of defining so-called groups, and groups are nothing more uh, than a set of user identities. Uh, and in most Unix systems and on Windows, um, you have uh, the constructs from a system uh, standpoint to be able to associate uh, user identities uh, with named groups. Um, of, uh, and, and you can specify resources <coughs> excuse me, uh, based on the group identifier. So let's say if you had a group called student and all of your user IDs uh, were associated with that group, and let's say there was a file called homework one, for example, uh, then that homework one, you could change its ownership to be that group student, and therefore everybody who happens to belong to that group called student can now access uh, this particular file. Uh, there's also something called uh, privilege escalation. And what that privilege escalation is, it's a way of allowing someone to temporarily perform something or interact with a resource uh, to which he or she usually uh, wouldn't be able uh, to have access or perform operations on. And this allows you to change things, and it's also good security practice, uh, in particular on uh, the Ubuntu distribution for Linux, uh, that privilege escalation command is called sudo, right? It allows you uh, to specify privileged operations that a select group of users, and you control that using an access list, a select uh, group of users is able to perform, and then when he or she enterprises to perform them, you type that word sudo to say temporarily escalate my privileges, give me more privileges, so that I can use uh, this special command to access or do things uh, that I access resources or do things that I otherwise wouldn't uh, be able to do. Uh, so let's take a brief look uh, at an example of privilege escalation and some of these IDs uh, that I was just uh, alluding to. Um, so let me see, let me, uh, nope, let me come up here. And there we go. So I have up uh, a basic uh, window or terminal uh, on Mac OS. Mac OS, uh, the kernel, the operating system, um, uh, is uh, Berkeley Systems Division or BSD uh, Unix. And as Unix, you can bring up a command window. And this is a command window. And so I'm going to uh, remotely log in to a machine in my lab, Laboratory for Intelligent Perceptual System or Systems or LIPS. Desu.edu. All right. Lips2.labs.desu.edu. No. Okay. I'm on the wrong network. I'll lose the monitor. Let me do this. I'll log into an outward facing machine. 
right? Uh, that's another one of my servers in my lab. All right, so I'm going to log in to Bodega, which is the name of the machine. Uh, give it my password. Hopefully I typed that correctly. And so now I'm remotely logged into uh, my machine. Question? Okay. So if you look at the home directory, right, it's not very interesting. It only has one because um, I'm the only person that uses this uh, outside for regular uh, access. Question? Could you please limit the side conversation? I can hear you. If it becomes an issue, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Thank you. So if we look at this so-called long listing, you'll see a user ID, gholeness. That's my user ID. And you'll see a bunch of characters here uh, on the first column. And D stands for directory. Uh, but you'll see three groups of character, in this case, RWX, R-X, R-X. Now the first uh, group, R stands for read, W stands for write, X stands for execute. Uh, so that means that the owner, G Holness, can, it's a directory, can read, write, or execute anything in this directory. Now, the next three digits you see here are blank, dash, dash, dash. That means there are no privileges for the group. So the first three set of characters are the user ID privileges, who can read, write, or execute. The next three pertain to the group, and the next three uh, pertain to everyone else universally. So if I go into that directory, and I make a listing, you'll see for some of these files, like license.lic, um, you'll see that gholeness has read, write, but not execute privileges. Uh, everyone in that group, gholeness, has read privileges only, and everyone else has read privileges. And so this is just a real example uh, from uh, Linux uh, where you can associate uh, these privileges, and it's exactly uh, an instance of protection and security. And the other products, uh, like the Windows products and you know the graphical user interface through Mac OS, it allows you to do that more friendly, uh, but from the command line, because underlying uh, Mac OS is Unix, uh, you can do that certainly uh, the quote unquote old fashioned way. All right, any questions about this? All right, so let's take a look at kernel data structures. And you've all taken data structures as a prerequisite for the class. And you know it's been said, if you really want to get good at data structures, uh, write a compiler or interact with parts of an operating system. Um, all the data structures that you talked about in algorithms, uh, data structures and algorithms, and all of the concerns associated with those data structures, like asymptotic uh, notation and runtime and things like that, you use all over the place uh, in operating systems. And so, some of the key data structures that you use in operating systems are a lot of applications of lists, uh, hash tables, and binary search trees. Right? Uh, so in particular, when you talk about a process and you say, get me a list of processes, right? and there's a way to do that from the command line. It's called PS in Linux. It'll give you all the processes. Um, it's going through a process table. And in that table or linked list um, will be a set of process control blocks. And it's just printing out information from all those process control blocks out of that uh, list of PCBs. Uh, so here we have a singly linked list. And a singly linked list, regardless of the language of implementation, it could be Python, it could be Java, it could be C, it could be C++. Uh, the structure is still the same. So data structures is a kind of logical thing. But how uh, that takes form in the language might differ from one language uh, to the next. And so um, a data structure in a singly linked list has the data portion, which is your payload, right? In something like Java, you would use objects, and each of the instance variables in uh, those objects would constitute uh, the data payload. Then you'd have a reference uh, in Java, because Java does not have pointers, and this reference would be a next reference. And if you traverse or use that next reference, it's going to bring you uh, to the next object instance, right? And so each uh, record, if you will, uh, in the singly linked list, as it's called, it only has a next pointer or next reference. Um, if you're using something like C, you'd have pointers, right? And a pointer is kind of like a reference, but you're dealing more with the addressing information. Unlike in languages like Java and Python, in Python it would be a reference. And so nonetheless, uh, regardless of the language of implementation, you're going to have the payload area in a single user-defined type. A user-defined type in Python, uh, you can have a Python object. It's uh, called an object in Java, and you define that uh, through a class. Um, and in something like C, it's going to be a struct or structure, 
right? Structure is how you do these user-defined types uh, in a language like C. And likewise, C++ has objects. You can use references or pointers in C++. And so singly linked list is such that each of your records has its payload information, and then it has a next reference or pointer, depending on your language, and that allows you to go from the first record in the list to the second, to the third, and so forth. And then uh, at the tail or end of the list, you'll notice here this null uh, as your next pointer. And that null reference or null pointer is used to connote that this is the end of list item. Now, you can choose to do whatever you want with the things in this list. You can choose to sort them or just add them and remove them or what have you. Next, we have a doubly linked list. And as the name might imply, it's doubly linked. And what does that mean? It means you have a next reference or pointer. So you'll uh, refer to or get, can get to the next uh, record in the list. And then you also have something called a previous pointer. Now, if you're at the front of the list, the previous pointer value or previous reference value is going to be null, right? That means you're at the front or the head of the list. Likewise, if you're at the end of the list, the next pointer here is going to be null. So you have, in this particular figure, um, the first item is your data. The second item in a record is your previous pointer, so prev. And then the third item is your next pointer or reference. And so the end of the list, the next pointer is null. At the beginning of the list, the previous pointer is null. And then if you want to go uh, to the subsequent record in the list, you use the next pointer. If you want to go to the previous record in the list, you use the prev pointer. And you can um, do whatever with that. You can have things in sorted order, in non-sorted order, or what have you. Okay. And then we have, lastly, the circular linked list. Uh, and the circular linked list looks just like a singly linked list, except uh, at the tail item, the next pointer refers back to the head of list. Now that can be useful um, when you're trying to frequently search for things and place things and, uh, and so forth. And it's really up to you which one you want to use. Um, the cost you pay for the doubly linked list is that the insertion and deletion process uh, is a little bit more complex. It's all big O uh, of one, but nonetheless, in real terms, you're going to have more steps uh, to um, dissect out or to wire in a new record for the double linked list versus uh, the other two. Okay. Any questions about this? And so we will spend some time uh, learning a little bit about the C programming language. Uh, the reason for that is that C exposes you to more of the details of the underlying system, whereas Java, its whole purpose was to protect you from some of those things. Uh, also, Python's purpose, in part, was to protect you from some of those things. And because we're studying operating systems, we're going to want to have uh, access to those underlying pieces of the operating system. So we're going to have to go over concepts uh, like pointers, which you probably haven't done. Has anyone done C? A little bit? Some of you? OK. All right. So we'll be doing a little bit of C uh, after we're done uh, with this module for chapter one. All right. So binary uh, search trees. A binary tree is called a binary tree because binary means two. And at each uh, node or level in the tree, you have at most two children. So this top node is our root of the tree. And then these bottom nodes, or nodes that don't have any so-called children, are called the leaves of the tree. Now, of course, this binary tree is very useful, especially when you're doing lookups or searching for things. Right? Um, the semantics or behavior of this binary tree is such that uh, the value that you store on the left child is less than or equal to the value that you store on the right child. And so it becomes very useful when you're trying to search because you can get a tremendous speed up uh, when you're trying uh, to uh, look at things or look things up on this binary tree. Now, you can think of it as a successive dividing uh, by two every time you look at how many data items uh, exist below a certain node uh, in this tree. So if we look at the root, all of the nodes occur beneath that. Then if you look on the left-hand child, well, that's about half of the nodes. Right-hand child, about half of the nodes uh, collectively are below that. And so as you go down the tree, you essentially get this successive dividing uh, in terms of the number of nodes that exist below it. And successive division is just logarithm, right? Um, so when you're trying to search the tree, if you can arrange your nodes so that it's so-called a balanced tree, meaning that you don't have most of the nodes on one side of the tree, 
it's sort of almost evenly distributed around the tree, you get this really nice property that lookups in this tree uh, get a so-called log n speed up, right? Uh, so instead of taking big O of n time, linear time, to search for something in the tree, you're um, taking the logarithm of the number of basic steps that you uh, would uh, make in order to search for something. Now that can really impact you when you're getting into large numbers, thousands of things, uh, even millions of things uh, that you want to search for. And so you might store, for example, if you're looking at certain values, you'd store it as a binary search tree. Um, a lot of high-end databases use something called B plus minus trees. And a B plus minus tree is a type of so-called red-black tree uh, that's laid out on disk, and it makes database lookups very, very fast. Okay? Um, you don't just lay it out arbitrarily on disk. You arrange it to benefit this uh, log n speed up property. Okay. Any questions about this? No? All right. So when you have a binary tree, there are various ways um, or so-called visitor patterns uh, that you can apply and get different orderings of things given the same data structure. And so oftentimes in algorithms, an algorithm, bless you, uh, goes hand in hand with a data structure. And if you change the data structure, you're going to change the properties associated with it. And part of any good design uh, is to choose the data structure uh, that's most appropriate for your application. That doesn't change whether using MATLAB or other uh, programming language bindings. You choose the data structure first and then uh, consider all the operations that you're going to perform on that data structure and what the implication is in terms of the runtime performance. Now, for you know assignments, you might not think it makes a difference, but for things like operating systems, it makes an absolute tremendous difference. You choose the wrong data structure, your performance is horrible. You choose the right data structure, your performance is excellent. Okay, so we have different ways of uh, visiting, as it's called, uh, all of the nodes in the data structure when you're searching for something. There's the so-called in-order traversal, pre-order traversal, and post-order traversal. And I won't get into all the details of that since you've all had data structures. I'll leave it to you uh, to look up the properties. Uh, these figures are from a public source. Okay. So given, you might ask, why should I care about the way I search for things, right? Uh, games, they use um, traversal of trees in an interesting way for something called depth-first search. Um, there's another type of search pattern called breadth-first search. And then there's, of course, in-order, uh, pre-order, and Post order. Suppose you're implementing a compiler, right? And that compiler consumes the text of your program. It builds something called a parse tree. A parse tree is akin to a binary tree, but you can have more than just two children. And when you do this post order search, essentially what you're doing is you're visiting, in the case of a parse tree, right? You're representing uh, the text of your program uh, as a as an as a K or E tree, uh, K children. Um, you'll notice each of the child nodes is visited before you have uh, the root node uh, of the parent of those children being visited. And what that means for a compiler is that you evaluate, let's say if you have an expression called A equals uh, B plus C, right? You need the value of the B plus C part, right? Or the B and the C part. The plus would be the, uh, the parent. And then the assignment equals A is going to be the other parts. And so what this post order, or at least the post order traversal of trees is used all over the place uh, when you're trying to decipher expressions uh, in your text, in your program text, uh, with a compiler. And you can take a whole semester of just compilers. I don't know if they teach it here anymore. Right. Any questions about this? Make sense? OK. So another very important data structure that's used, uh, among other places, in operating systems uh, is a hash table. And this hash table. It looks like a list or an array, uh, and you have associated with it something called a hash function. Right? It's the same hash that you might have in security. You can implement a very uh, cheap hash function uh, by adding up the characters of your, your hash and uh, com uh, doing the XOR of every character with the other character. It's a quick and dirty way to do it. Um, some people use it for symbol tables and compilers. But nonetheless, you have this hash function. And this hash function, when you input a string or value into it, it's going to produce another value, and that value is called a hash, right? So you give it a key, and it produces a hash. Now that hash is going to map to one of n many values, and those n many outputs of the hash function is going to correspond to a position or so-called slot in the hash table. Um, if you're ever in Java, um, an object reference in the Java runtime 
uh, is a hash slot entry. And if you did uh, a print line, system out print line, on the object, cast your Java object to uh, Java Lang object and do a system out print line on that, you're going to see a number. And that number is, is the hash slot entry. Okay? And so the reason why hash functions and hash tables are really important is that this hash function is typically very efficient to run. It's big O of one, right? Um, so it's very efficient to run. And then it takes no more than linear time uh, to insert or uh, remove something from the hash table, right? Once you get a slot. And so that's really, really fast if you have a lot of things that you want to store. Uh, and you know you don't really have a good way to organize them, like a binary tree or B plus minus tree uh, or what have you. So uh, so-called hash maps are uh, these uh, functions, if you will. And there's a java.util.hashmap. Um, and a lot of languages have uh, similar types of uh, objects uh, in their libraries. And what the hash map does, it allows you to specify arbitrary uh, uh, values, whole classes, and use that as your hash key. And so what a hash map does, it uses a hash function to associate a name, an arbitrary uh, string, uh, with, a, with, uh, with a value. So if you were, uh, for example, uh, trying to store properties, right? You have a student, and a student has uh, a curriculum. A student has a graduation date. A student has an address and all sorts of things. You might use a hash map uh, as the way you'd store that. And once you get uh, the particular entry in your hash slot, uh, you then access all the instance variables with all that information. So it's a relatively stable. When I say stable, I mean that as you scale, the number of things that you store it, as you increase the number of things that you, uh, that you store in a hash map, uh, the performance does not degrade like other things might. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? So you can certainly, and we will take a look at this, you can go uh, to the source code for Linux, and you will see all these data structures and their splendor and glory, including hash maps and lists and stacks and queues and all sorts of things like that. Okay. If there are no questions, any questions about this? All right, uh, let me continue on. So let's take a look at computing environments. And um, there are lots of traditional environments. And you might say, gosh, well, I just use my mobile device or I use my laptop. Uh, but that's not the only way you can experience computation. Now, certainly there are some things that are kind of artifacts historically. And it's important to kind of see where things have been because really a lot of things that you use now are just rehashes of things from way back, right? So. You know, you all use instant messaging. Instant messaging is nothing more than network talk from back in the 70s. It's network talk over the wide area, right? That's all it is. If you don't know what that is, Google search network talk. And you'll see, oh my gosh, that's instant messaging, right? Uh, virtual machines. Virtual machines were pioneered also back in the 70s by IBM. And it was a way to share multi-user systems. We had a bunch of terminals in a big computer room and a big computer that would maybe fill a room twice the size of this one. And so with modern tools and modern processors, virtualization was recast as a way to run one operating system inside of another. So it's really important uh, to study or at least be aware of all of these old ideas because oftentimes uh, these new uh, systems or quote unquote new systems are just modern uh, incarnations of something that's quite old. MapReduce that Google uses all over the, t all over the place, it's just MapReduce from uh, Lisp language that's been recast in a distributed system. That's all it is, nothing special about it, right? Very powerful, but it's an old idea, recast using modern tools and modern infrastructure. Okay, so computing environment, typically uh, we have these standalone general purpose machines. That's what you all uh, grew up with, that's what you all know, right? Everyone has a box and even less so now. Um, I remember when I was your age, we had a, you know, all these boxes in a computer room. And now you have your mobile laptop, so now you can bring your computation with you where you want to go instead of having to go to the computer room in front of a general purpose machine. So as the interconnect, the network has gotten faster, you've uh, been able to do more interesting things with these general purpose systems. And moreover, as the wireless network has gotten faster, you've also been able to do more things with it. So you know, just think back, or maybe you've experienced, or maybe you've heard about it, but I remember when modems were 128 kilobit and you had to do dial-up, right? You only had certain types of applications that you could do. Now, with broadband, you have much faster speeds, and the idea of streaming audio and video is now a thing. Now, I don't know if you know Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks. 
Well, how Mark Cuban became a billionaire is he developed the very first MP3 download site. It was called mp3.com. And that was bought by Yahoo and became Yahoo Music. And that's where streaming music started, right? Didn't start with Spotify, didn't start with, uh, with um, Pandora or any of those things. It's because of mp3.com, okay? Now, certainly it's evolved over time. And instead of downloading MP3 files, now you stream live music as it goes, as the network gets more and more fast. And when 5G is more prevalent, you're going to see even more interesting applications. And I promise you, five, 10 years from now, you're going to be saying, gosh, I remember when we only had 4G LTE, right? Uh, it's going to happen. So a lot of things happen every time you have a technological breakthrough. And one of the things that happens is this idea of portals, right? Um, instead of having a lot of files with policy guides, and I remember when I was an intern in college, uh, it was at Lotus Development Corporation. Uh, one was at Polaroid as an electrical engineering undergrad. Um, when you started on in the summer, you just get maybe volumes and volumes, big binders full of corporate policy, right? And that's a waste of paper. We didn't think of it back then. Uh, they didn't think of it back then, but it is a waste of paper. And now, you know, with the advent of the World Wide Web, you had this electronic document that mimicked closely uh, what the page, printed page was. So you could do away with this printed page and save paper, and moreover, you could update this uh, website as new policies came online, and you didn't have to go and distribute all these big binders full of information. And so the whole idea of a web portal was uh, a way to capture all of this uh, corporate knowledge that used to be pushed to all the employees uh, via documentation and physical mail memos and things like that. But it's only for internal access. And they, companies still use it. Sometimes they host it off-site, but it's still very heavily used. Network computers. Um, thin clients, as it was called. I remember back when I was working at Sun Microsystems, uh, the whole idea of a thin client was nothing more uh, than the modern version, at least at the time, of a so-called uh, terminal. They called it a dumb terminal because it didn't do anything. It was literally just printing out on the screen what came from the shared uh, large multi-user computer. Now, this network computer, the idea there, right, and it evolved uh, during that period in the 90s. Uh, Sun Microsystems was a big vendor of uh, so-called thin clients, as they called it then, was the idea that if you have, let's say, an accounting office and you have 100 accountants working for you, sometimes you need to upgrade the software. Now, it used to be that you'd have to have people come and install stuff. Typically, they do it at night or after hours so you wouldn't lose productivity during uh, the business day. Now, with this network computer, the idea was that the computer gets everything it needs, the applications and the operating system over the network, right? And so you turn on the system, it would boot, it would load the operating system and run it uh, from some server, and then it would load all the applications. And so with that sort of setup or scenario, you don't have to go around and maintain the individual systems. You just update it on the server, which would push out uh, new versions if there were uh, up, if there were updates. It would push out new versions uh, to all of the terminals. So it made the management of resources and what the typical desktop should be for various job functions. It made it a lot easier. And so certainly networking has become ubiquitous. It wasn't always so. I remember uh, back when I was an intern. Um, we were the only ones that had a network connection in my neighborhood, well, not neighborhood, but one of the few, right? Um, and certainly it's much more common now uh, such that the average person typically has um, security measures in place, be that firewalls and things like that, especially uh, since more and more you rely on online uh, for things like banking and travel and medical stuff and so forth. Um, I don't know if you know, but Delaware is one of the top states in the nation as it pertains to electronic medical records, right? In fact, we were very early in doing that uh, back in the early uh, 2000s. I wasn't here uh, yet, but um, that's what I was reading. So as you do things like medical records and do things like banking, you want to make sure you're protecting yourself because the new form of criminal uh, is purely digital, right? And you've kind of seen or read about instances of that. Okay, so mobile was a huge advancement. Um, I remember in the early days of cell phones, I didn't have one, uh, but it looked like, a, like a, a toiletry bag, and it was pretty big, and it had a big handset, and they called it a car phone, right? Because uh, you'd use it in your car. And when that advanced to the point where you could actually carry this mobile phone or this mobile device on your person, that really changed a lot. 
And as more and more processing capability happened, and they started adding cameras to cell phones. And I remember when that first happened, it was like, why would someone want a camera, right? Does anyone ever remember carrying around a digital camera, right? Or film camera, no? When you had a film camera, right, you just sort of, you kind of hold your shot, because eh, I only have 12 shots left. Then you have to go to Walgreens, and you'd pay like $6.99 to develop it. You'd have to wait two weeks, and you'd see it, and you're like, damn it, ah, I just wasted that shot, right? So then when you had digital camera, right, it got a little bit better. You were kind of more generous with taking your shots because, you know, it didn't cost you uh, to make a mistake. And then they put a camera in a phone, right? That was a huge advancement. Right? Uh, and of course now with mobile, you can now take those pictures and send them places, do things with them. Right? So let's say you, know, you have a kid in school and you say, are you really at home? They say, yes I am, here's a picture. There's me and there's the rest of the house. Right? And you can timestamp them and stuff like that. So another pretty interesting thing that's come online is augmented reality. And there was that game oh, by, Nin oh, what was it called? Oh, man, I forgot the name. What's that game? Um, you know, the mobile augmented reality. We had the um, people were walking around. Um, po Pokemon Go. Thank you. Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go was the first, not the first augmented reality game, but it was absolutely huge. It really brought uh, augmented reality into uh, common uh, public uh, consciousness, right? And so what augmented reality requires, if you think about it, you have a camera taking live shots of where you are, and now you have to use your graphics card and render or draw things that are in your field of view. And you have to do that real time as it happens. Moreover, you have other devices like a gyroscope and a GPS. The gyroscope reads the attitude or the position of your device. So if you take your device and you turn it, or you move it this way or that way, the gyroscope is that sensor that's working real time uh, to detect and read those movements. And GPS is your location. So the idea that you can have a virtual creature in Pokemon Go walking around behind you and you decide to turn and you see it on your live video as if it's really happening, right? That's a relatively new breakthrough, only a couple years old, the ability to do that on mobile devices. And so uh, these computing environments, virtual is I think there's a place where that's really gonna take off. Um, think about things like aircraft maintenance, right? As I understand, aircraft maintenance is very complex. Imagine taking a picture of a part of the aircraft and then using that picture to look up uh, the parts guide in a catalog and the spec on how to maintain it and how much flight time required is, uh, after how much flight time are you required to maintain it and replace it and all that stuff. So you have lots and lots of uh, computing environments and it's changed quite rapidly, even just in the nine years I've been here. And I promise you it's going to change rapidly um, in the time that you have left at DSU, as well as over your careers. Okay. And all of this, the common thing, is it's all managed by operating systems, right? So whether you never touch the internals of an operating system after this class, uh, you're certainly going to be impacted uh, by the design considerations uh, for an operating system if you're going to be involved in technology in any sort of way. Okay. So then, because uh, these systems became more capable, uh, more powerful, and the network uh, became faster, now you have these distributed computing environments. Uh, a distributed algorithm is nothing more uh, than a process uh, that is running, uh, different processes are running on different machines, and they communicate with one another uh, to give you the illusion, you, the user, uh, that it's a single application. So when you go on Google Street View, right, uh, there's a lot of stuff happening. You're, uh, you type in the name of a place, of a location. Well, something, some process somewhere has to look up the latitude and longitude of that. Then there's another process that has to access the satellite imagery for that. And then there's another one that has to draw it. And then there's another process when you kind of scroll and do your virtual street drive through. There's another one that has to look up the street view uh, video uh, or images and actually stitch those images together and present it to you. But to you, you think it's just one application that runs, but it's a bunch of different computers exchanging messages across the network over the wide area to give you the illusion that it's a single application. 
And so distributed computing is another uh, type of uh, computing environment that's important to pay attention to. And for the most part, the predominant underlying protocol is TCP IP, Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol. Uh, TCP is a combination TCP part is uh, the so-called transport protocol, and IP is the network protocol. And when you take computer networking um, next semester, uh, you learn all about that. So we have these so-called local area networks, and these networks differ uh, by uh, how far apart or how distributed, if you will, each of these computers is uh, that are interacting with one another in a single application. So for local area network, that's typically in an environment like within a single uh, corporate environment, like a single campus or a single building more correctly. Then there's wide area network. It's across two local area networks. So if you're going from say uh, the science uh, college to maybe arts and humanities, you're going across uh, what's called the wide area. Then there's metropolitan area uh, networks. Those are high speed substrates in large metropolitan areas. Uh, so a place like Philadelphia certainly has metropolitan area networks. Uh, because these uh, entities typically want to exchange data uh, with one another. So they will literally take microwave dishes and point them at one another, point to point, uh, on top of large buildings in order to facilitate that. And then you also have in the small, these networks, personal area networks, things like Bluetooth, uh, things like CAN bus, things like uh, Zigbee, right? 802.11.15.4 uh, protocol for an IEEE. And the idea that you might want to have a body area network you have a bunch of devices on your person that are communicating with one another. Uh, so maybe your smartwatch or your phone is communicating with your Bluetooth headset. And then, you know, a lot of this fitness uh, stuff, you might have a pedometer talking to a heart monitor and all sorts of stuff. This idea that you'd want to network devices or machines or processors together over um, maybe no more than three or four feet from one another. Okay. Uh, so this idea of a so-called network operating system it's a type of operating system uh, that acknowledges in its basic services the fact that a network of some sort exists and it exchanges or has a lot of um, uh, extravagant or a lot of very fancy primitives that allow a seamless communication uh, between individual installations of operating system to give you the illusion uh, that you have a single system. And so um, NFS, network file system, uh, Sun Microsystems before it went bust after the dot-com bust, uh, in the late 90s, uh, Sun Microsystems was a premier uh, purveyor of network file systems, right? And so with that, you can have a directory that looks like it's a folder on your system, but when you access it, you're really sending data back and forth to another server, right? Uh, so that's just one example of a component for a network operating system. And so you'll hear terminology um, about certain other types of compute environments, particularly uh, those that are distributed, and one's called client server. Now, client server is a way of the specific, uh, uh, is an example of a specific way in which you uh, distribute various processes. And when you do that, you have to give each one a role, right? And so there's something called the client role, and the client role in a so-called client server uh, compute environment uh, is the entity that initiates uh, the communication, right? So when you go to your browser, you type in a URL, and you hit enter, uh, your machine is the client in an act interaction with some server. So you type in www.amazon.com and your client, your browser is the client. And there's a server somewhere in Amazon, a server role in this client server architecture is that process that responds to a request. So the client initiates, I need a web page of stuff on sale. And the server says, uh, satisfies that. It gets that request that looks up the HTML for that website of stuff uh, that's on sale, it sends it back through the wire uh, indirectly through the network card, and your browser draws it on your screen as Amazon.com's uh, web page. Okay, so you can do this not just with web shopping, but you can do it with a file system. And as such, you can have your access to your files, but in truth, that's really being stored somewhere on a server in a data center, and that allows you to do multiple things. That means you can kind of bring your files with you without having to carry around a USB stick or some sort of storage, but also you can now have uh, backups, regular backups uh, on the server. If anyone uses Dropbox, you'll notice that Dropbox, if you um, pay the 10 bucks a month for the professional version, uh, Dropbox will save 30-day versions of your files, right? Uh, so what they're doing is they're just presenting you a link to uh, a backwards window in time of 30 days worth of backups, right? Okay, any questions about this? 
That makes sense? Okay. So let's continue on. Does anyone use like Lime, uh, LimeWire or BitTorrent? BitTorrent? Okay. All right. I don't care what to use it for, but um, so BitTorrent is a is a so-called peer-to-peer uh, type uh, environment, right? Compute environment, and a peer is any process uh, that can act like a server as well as a client, right? And the reason why that's important is that it brings along with it this property called self-scalability, right? That's not on the slide. That's just something that I know, so I thought I'd share it with you. Um, with a peer-to-peer -peer system. In the case of something like um, like BitTorrent, right? So let's say you know um, you're trading music to which you own a copyright because this gets posted, um, and you just you know don't want to spend all the time it takes to rip all of your CDs, right? So you know you decide to exchange uh, files on uh, BitTorrent or LimeWire or something like that. So you have a piece of a file, or let's say a JDK, let's say that, that's even better, right? You want to download a Java development kit, it's pretty big, right? Uh, so you go on uh, BitTorrent and you say, you know what, I'm looking for uh, JDK 9 or whatever version you're looking for, or Linux uh, distribution or what have you. So you don't have any pieces of it, and so your peer uh, is acting like a client and it's initiating a request, and there are other um, peers out there they act like servers, they have pieces of that file. So your uh, system logically chops up uh, the JDK into pieces and requests different pieces from each of those peers that are running on the network. Now, of course, the reason why it is, uh, has this property called self-scalability um, is that every person that joins uh, this LimeWire, this BitTorrent uh, type system, you not only come with requests for files, but you also bring with you um, pieces of files that other people don't have. So unlike other systems, as you add users, yes, you add demand, but you also add more capacity, the ability to upload pieces of files. That's why BitTorrent is so fast, because you're downloading small pieces of your file from 10, 20, 100,000 uh, different places. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Make sense? Okay, so we won't talk about peer-to-peer -peer in detail, just kind of mention it as a compute environment from the perspective of an operating system. Uh, but if you take computer networking, uh, we actually spend a little bit more time uh, on that. Okay, so I already said that broadcast. You need something in BitTorrent that's called a tracker. Uh, so you need a place to go to request uh, who else is out there, right? You sometimes use broadcasting sometimes. Um, most network administrators don't forward broadcast across the wide area. Uh, so often you connect to something called the tracker and the tracker acts like a phone book, right? Anytime someone joins uh, the torrent, they register in the phone book and anyone who joins says who else is around, you go to the phone book and it gives you a list of names or samples a list of names and presents that to you as possible trading partners in the torrent. Okay, so we also have uh, virtualization. And there are two ways of doing this. One's called emulation. It's when you literally translate one machine code instruction to another. That's very, very slow. That's how Apple, when they switched, um, I think it was from, I can't remember, from Motorola to Intel or something like that. But um, you literally issue an instruction in one uh, machine code and you translate it to another. It'll work, uh, but it's slow. And typically when you switch over to different um, to different underlying processors, that's how you maintain support uh, for the old uh, software written for the old uh, processor, or uh, the old generation or different type of processor. And then there's virtualization. With virtualization, you emulate a processor and then you install an operating system on that emulated processor. Uh, and that allows you then to run, say, um, Microsoft Windows on a so-called virtual machine, even though your operating system in your machine is running Mac OS. Okay. And so this virtualization has become really popular because it allows you, let's say you have Mac and you're running Mac OS, but you also want to develop products that run on Windows. Uh, it allows you to now have access to Windows without having to buy a second piece of hardware. Uh, there's a free uh, virtualization uh, hypervisor uh, called VirtualBox, and we'll be using that uh, with the virtual machine instance uh, to give you access to internals of, uh, of, uh, of an operating system. Okay. So here uh, on your left, um, there's 
uh, a typical setup. You have your raw hardware. Sometimes that's called the bare metal, right? The silicon and metal, but they just call it bare metal in industry. Uh, then you have the OS kernel running on top of that. Uh, that would be your operating system. And then you have processes on top of that. Those would be your applications. So if your kernel is um, the Mac OS kernel, which is BSD Unix, then your processes would be things like your uh, Mac software, including like iTunes and all that other good stuff. Uh, so which vir with, with virtualization, you have in this particular instance, this is called uh, a hypervisor, right? Hyper, hypervisor. And a hypervisor is uh, a virtual machine manager that runs on the bare metal, right on the hardware. Uh, you can have a hypervisor that runs on an operating system, and that's what VirtualBox does. But in this particular case, you have a hypervisor, your virtual machine manager, that runs right on the hardware. So then within this, you create multiple virtual machines, or you could say instances of emulated processors. And on the first one, you might run, say, Linux. On the second one, you might run, say, Windows. On the third one, you might run, you know, uh, maybe Kali Linux, the security uh, distribution of Linux. So in that regard, you can have multiple operating systems running um, and uh, not ha damage the other instances. If you're interacting in a secure, in a security, uh, in the security domain, and let's say you want to test out um, some protection and you want to visit websites that are known uh, to have a lot of exploits on them. So rather than installing this setup, right, you're better off installing a virtual machine and running your operating system uh, on top of that virtual machine so that if you end up uh, messing up the operating system, you're not doing damage to the rest of the machine. Okay? All right, so it's very useful if you're dealing uh, with security domain, uh, if you're going to go out and try out your system on all sorts of uh, nefarious uh, websites. Okay. Let's see the time. Okay, we have a little bit of time left. Any questions about this? Make sense? Okay. So uh, cloud computing. Um, more and more things are going to cloud computing. The neat part about cloud computing is that if you have a need for uh, computation, let's say a lot of computation, but you only need it for a fixed period of time. So let's say you know you're working on something and you need a hundred processors. Now it's a lot more expensive to go out and buy 100 machines and use them. Now you're stuck with it, right? What do you do afterwards? You sell them off at a loss, not going to get much for it. Why not rent those 100 processors that you need just for that week or that month? And that's what uh, these cloud computing environments uh, do for you. It's an extension of virtualization and many physical setups in cloud computing environments. They get really powerful machines and they install a bunch of virtualized instances on it. And what you're getting when you rent uh, in a cloud system, you rent capacity, you're getting an instance of a virtual, of a virtual machine. So here maybe, um, you know, Joe is renting this and Mary is renting that uh, for a month and a half, whatever, uh, for her uh, capstone project or what have you, right? And then when you're done, they just get rid of this instance and the next person that wants to rent capacity, they create a new virtual machine instance and you're off and running and they have the metering for it uh, to, for you to pay for that usage. And so there are many types of cloud environment. Amazon um, Web Services, uh, uh, their Elastic Cloud is very, very popular. Uh, Microsoft's Azure Cloud is coming online. They're doing pretty well. Google has their cloud environment. Uh, virtualization in a, in a cloud computing environment and this idea of renting capacity on demand is really where it's going. Dropbox makes use of Amazon Cloud for their underlying server infrastructure. Um, there are many types of cloud environments. There's a public cloud, which is available to anyone um, for the right price. Of course, you have to rent that usage. There's also secure clouds, right? Uh, there's the public uh, business that someone like Verizon and all these cloud purveyors might have, but there's also, uh, for certain sensitive government work, there's also a secure cloud that has um, extra, um, extra fail-safes and other uh, mechanisms associated with it. Uh, there's private clouds, so companies will stand up their own cloud-based environments. Netflix, uh, they have private cloud. You cannot access the compute environment for Netflix. You're using it when you watch their movies, but you can't access it yourself and rent their capacity. Um, without knowing much about it, uh, I can guarantee you uh, they have specialized hardware uh, optimized for uh, compression of video, right? They have to, because video is their business, and the more the higher the rate that Netflix can get video to you, uh, the better uh, their business. 
Uh, there are also hybrid clouds that include both. I won't talk that much about it. Um, there are also this ideas, these ideas, there are also these ideas of trying to virtualize various things that we would typically have in a single system. So the so-called software as a service. When you're using Google Docs, right, that's software as a service. You're running something that looks like a word processor um, in your browser, but you're doing it by connecting back through a server and you're using dynamic HTML to draw the buttons and stuff like that. You also have something called platform as a, as a, as a service or PAAS. That's where you have the runtime stack. So all the libraries, programming environments, and other services like database that you might need, and it's delivered to you uh, across the internet. Um, if you've ever heard of these things like containers, like Docker, and Kubernetes, right? Those are examples of platform as a service. You download this container and it's an environment that goes to your machine. It's been prepackaged. You download it over the internet and it has all the runtime APIs and software needed to do a particular um, application like LAMP, uh, Linux, Apache, I forgot what the MMP stand for. Anyways, uh, so that's platform as a service. It's all the runtime libraries plus other um, pieces like databases that you need for implementing a specific type of application. So if you want someone to run your application or you want someone to develop something, you just give them the platform across the network and they're off and running. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, so infrastructure as a service, that's where you're adding other pieces uh, like backup and storage and things like that, those infrastructure pieces. Uh, now you have something called software-defined networking where you can even um, alter the data flows across the network custom to the application. And that also you can include as part of your infrastructure as a service. It's just not mainstream right now. But a lot of companies like Google and Facebook are using it to migrate mass amounts of data between data centers in various locations around the world. Okay. Any questions about this? It makes sense? Yeah, no questions? All right. Uh, so a little bit we'll talk about cloud computing. When you have a clustered environment in a cloud computing uh, scenario, a uh, cluster meaning you have more than one machine uh, acting uh, to satisfy incoming requests. Uh, and the reason why you have multiple machines is because you want it to be fast and you want to support a lot of users. You want it to be scalable. So here you have an incoming request over the internet, right? And the customer um, interface might be your Netflix uh, application. You see a list of movies and you decide to click on something that you like. So that obviously or certainly goes through a firewall because you want to make sure the right type of requests are coming in. And then you have this thing called the cluster controller or load balancer. Now this load balancer, it gets reports regularly from each of the virtualized instances about how loaded they are. And the heuristic is typically when an incoming request happens, you're going to send it out to the most lightly loaded server instance. Uh, and so that keeps your responses fast and it keeps them manageable. So this is a general um, cluster cloud computing environment, and it's the load balancer's responsibility uh, to make sure that no one node uh, gets too bogged down. Okay, uh, so embedded in real-time systems. Now, whether you know it or not, uh, embedded in real-time systems are the predominant or most numerous uh, types of operating systems out there. Um, you have a microwave. There is a processor running some operating system. Uh, you have uh, a washing machine and dryer. There is a processor running some operating a processor running some operating system. Um, these more complex fridges with the touch screens, there's a processor running uh, some operating system. And so the average person usually has a few dozen processors um, involved uh, in their uh, in daily existence. And I'm not even referring to uh, things like you know your laptop and your mobile device. Uh, modern automobiles have at least one to two dozen different processors uh, involved. Things like the braking, things like the engine control, things like the emissions, things like the radio, things like, you name it, the car computer, everything um, has a processor. And for those types of systems, you have something called a real-time operating system. Uh, what real-time implies is that not only do you compute some task, but that task also has a hard timing guarantee. So for example, if you have anti-lock brakes, you mash your brake pedal, Right? You just press it. You don't tap it and pulse your brakes that way. You just press it. Well, um, there's a computer in your car. It gets that signal by wire, and then it pulses your brakes at a specific rate. Right? Um, and so all of that has to happen in a hard deadline, meaning that a few milliseconds, like two milliseconds, no more than two milliseconds, when you press that brake, 
the brake pedal has to engage, the, the brake shoe uh, has to engage, right? And so these real-time operating systems are a little bit different because you don't just write software as you normally would. Uh, there are analytical systems associated with them that give you actual guarantees that not only does this process run, but it will run and complete in a specific amount of time. Because when you're attached to physical systems, like your anti-lock braking system, um, you can't afford to have something take longer uh, than a guaranteed amount of time. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? And we won't talk about real-time operating systems, or RTOS, as they're called, R-T-O-S. Um, but I just want to make you aware uh, that they're out there. And then lastly, open source. Uh, you're all familiar with, or at least have heard about Linux. Um, the open source movement was started by Richard Stallman by the Free uh, Software Foundation. Uh, you can uh, Google search him, quite an interesting uh, character, interesting personality. Uh, but previously to that, um, you had to pay money for operating systems, and also you didn't have access to the source code. And the philosophy goes that when you can look behind the curtain and see the implementation, you get better products. Is that always the case? Well, there are arguments for or against, because if somebody's mortgage depends on implementing something, right, their livelihood, you might get better quality. That's not always the case. And Linux is a big example of that not always being the case. And so the idea between these, uh, uh, behind these open source operating systems is that by licensing, forcing anyone who uses it, you can freely use it, you can edit it, you can look at the source code, you can make your own, uh, you can sell it if you want to. You're free to do that. Um, it makes it more stable because people contribute, many people contribute to improving it uh, over time. Now take Linux. I remember um, early versions of Linux in the early 90s uh, was much less sophisticated than it is now. And there are many examples where Linux is far superior uh, to uh, the four pay closed source operating systems. And so most embedded systems right now are some variant of Linux. If you wanted to start your own little embedded system company and go for it, please do. You just download a copy of Linux and there is real time Linux and you just spin your own system with it and then sell it. You're free to do that with open source. Whereas if you wanted to take um, Microsoft's uh, embedded uh, Windows, you have to pay Microsoft for it. No it's ands, or buts, or ways around it. Uh, so open source has tremendous value. Um, and the next slide, I have a bunch of uh, links uh, that are aggregation lists of various open source systems, as well as a professional journal that talks about uh, Linux internals. And uh, with that, um, we have ended the module on chapter one. Uh, and we will segue on Tuesday uh, to see programming uh, to give you some bootstrap information to start looking at uh, the material from chapter two, uh, which has some examples about the programming interface uh, for various parts of operating systems. Um, any final questions? Yeah, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. Any questions? No? All right, so we're a little early with that. We'll end here and uh, we'll see you all on Tuesday.